Mr. President, um, um, welcome. And uh, we have a lot of participants already at our event. We're a few minutes behind the schedule, so we're ready to start the meeting, so start, start the recording. So we're all in your hands. Great. I want to welcome everybody. Je voudrais tous vous souhaiter the South Caucasus. The fact that so many parliamentarians have registered for this webinar, I think reaffirms the importance we all attach to this region and to its peaceful and democratic development. Today's discussion offers an important and timely opportunity for us to review the significant developments which the South Caucasus region has experienced during the past year. Our NATO alliance is adapting to new security environments as the NATO summit in Brussels two weeks ago made very clear. The keys to this adaptation lie, in my view, first, in the reaffirmation of the values that unite us. Second, in funding and modernizing our defense capabilities, meeting the emerging challenges such as those posed by Russia and China. And third, in bolstering our partnerships, which undergird one of the greatest strengths of the alliance that countries want to join our cause. I welcome that the NATO summit reaffirmed the importance of working with like-minded partners in addressing a broad range of challenges, from Russia's aggressive and destabilizing behavior to China's increasingly assertive ambitions, from cyber threats to disinformation and attempts to undermine our democratic processes and the rules-based order, from terrorism to climate change. The summit also restated NATO's commitment to helping build the capacity of partners and reaffirmed that NATO's door remains open to Georgia and Ukraine and other aspirants. All of these are priorities which our assembly highlighted in its recommendations to the summit. Most importantly, we recommended that NATO should rededicate itself to its shared democratic values. These values are what distinguish NATO from any other military alliance, and I would argue a key reason why countries like Georgia or Ukraine want to join our alliance. These values must therefore be a key driver in our partnerships as well, an agenda which our assembly is particularly well placed to support and promote. The assembly's flagship Rose Roth program, initiated back in 1991 by Congressman Charlie Rose and Senator Bill Roth, was conceived in precisely this spirit. Over three decades, this program has become a unique platform bringing together lawmakers from NATO and partner countries, experts, government officials, and civil society representatives to promote dialogue, support the development of democratic parliamentary oversight, and to enhance parliamentary awareness of and share experience and expertise. I'm sure that today, again, our discussions will help further these important goals. We'll first hear from Ambassador Philippe Brandt, head of the Swiss mission to NATO. We're very grateful for the Swiss government's support for the Rose Roth program, and we highly value our cooperation with the Swiss authorities and the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance. Then Rosaria Puglisi, head of the NATO liaison office for the South Caucasus, and a great friend of our assembly, who will give some opening remarks on behalf of NATO. I'm very grateful to Rosaria for also agreeing to moderate our discussion today, as I unfortunately have to leave this meeting to go to the German Marshall Fund. Rosaria will introduce our four panelists, but I also want to thank Mr. Thomas Dewan, Mr. Tengers Pagratulatsi, Mr. Talin Papazanian, and Mr. Kavas Abushov for taking the time to be with us today and to share insights on the challenges facing the South Caucasus and what NATO nations can do to support durable peace and stability in the region. In particular, we look forward to hearing how we can further support Georgia in fending off Russia's ongoing aggression and advancing its European Atlantic aspirations. Both as president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and co-chair of the Georgia Caucus here in the United States Congress, I've consistently reaffirmed our unwavering support for Georgia's territorial integrity and Euro-Atlantic path. I also want to do that again today. At the same time, to advance on the path to NATO membership, Georgia, of course, must continue to work to consolidate democracy and the rule of law 
and to reduce political polarization. I also hope our panelists will help us better understand the consequences of the deadly war Armenia and Azerbaijan fought in the fall last year. Our assembly has firmly condemned the use of force to resolve differences between these two countries. We now must look to the future and to identify ways to sustain the fragile peace and move toward a full and more durable resolution of this conflict. Colleagues, we have a lot on our agenda, so I'll stop here and invite Ambassador Brandt to take the floor. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Good afternoon. I think Michael is now on. Uh, Mr. President, um, distinguished, distinguished MPs, uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear colleagues, it is, uh, as always, a great pleasure for me to welcome you all on behalf of the Swiss government to, the, to this Rosa Roth webinar. Unfortunately, the pandemic is still with us and we must once again meet virtually. Um, <clears throat> As many of you already know, there is a tradition of Switzerland supporting exchanges um, among parliamentarians in the framework of, of these Rose Roth seminars, um, but also beyond. Switzerland is a multiple cooperation partner to the parliament. All our projects aim at reinforcing parliamentarians' capacity to develop independent views and opinions sustaining and enriching their country's democracy. This uh, specific seminar is all the more important as it allows dialogue not only within the region, but also includes experts and MPs from a vast range of NATO partners and allies. Um, since uh, 1990 already, the Rose Roth seminars have been fruitful meeting places for the exchange of a broad variety of thoughts and opinions, as I said. Beyond the topics discussed, we consider this, this type of meeting as an important cornerstone for the development of cooperative security. Through its participation in the Partnership for Peace and the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, Switzerland confirms that it fully shares the values on which both institutions are based. Indeed, we firmly believe that stability and security in the Euro-Atlantic area can only be achieved through cooperation. Switzerland's involvement in the South Caucasus aims at the needs and priorities of its three partners' states in the region. It focuses on making economic development inclusive and sustainable, improving the efficiency of democratic institutions and human security. Furthermore, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governments, DCAF, as well as its sister center, the Geneva Center for Security Policy, GCSP, have also maintained a long-term commitment to the region. Over the last years, DCAF implemented activities in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. It has also prepared knowledge products and analytical studies, many of which were translated into local languages, including Azerbaijani and Georgian. For almost two years now, despite the pandemic, DCAF has been able to continue to produce content, either through virtual events or through the provision of studies or reference manuals to promote norms and good practices regarding security sector governance. Please allow me to illustrate the commitment of DCAF with the support of the Swiss government with some specific examples. In 2020, DCAF has begun a multi-year cooperation program with the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Georgia to develop and implement an ethics framework for MOD staff. Under this initiative, DCAF and the MOD of the Republic of Georgia have organized several roundtables focusing on advancing the principles of integrity, professionalism and excellence across the structures of the MOD through the development of a code of ethics and the establishment of an ethics council. 
DCAF cooperated with the NATO BI team and the NATO liaison office in Georgia in this endeavor. To support this initiative, <clears throat> DCAF has also updated and translating the Building Integrity website into the Georgian language and is preparing an e-learning course on military ethics. In 2021, the project has shifted focus to building the capacity of the members of the Ethics Council to oversee the implementation of the Code of Ethics, with physical trainings foreseen for the fall. DCAF is also developing activities to protect the rights of military conscripts, an area, an area frequently overlooked in research and practice. In late 2020, DCAF developed the first ever legal handbook on the rights of conscripts, which outlines the application of international human rights law uh, to military conscripts with a focus, among others, on the South Caucasus. In addition to these engagements, DCAF continues to work with the civil society organizations across the South Caucasus to build the capacities to oversee the defense and security sector which includes, among others, the provision of support for an assessment of social policies in the Ministry of Defense of, in, of Georgia. DCAF also chairs the Security Sector Reform Working Group of the Partnership for Peace Consortium. Under this platform, DCAF convenes annual society, civil society and parliamentary forums to, di to discuss issues pertinent to the security sector governments with a focus on South Caucasus. The last such convocation examined issues including the rights of conscripts in national emergencies, oversight of the intelligence sector and the role of civil society in contributing to parliamentary oversight of the security sector. The Swiss commitment to this region is long-term and our continued support to the Partnership for Peace and the Rose Roth Seminars is a modest but clear confirmation of this engagement. I want to conclude by expressing the sincere wish that the coming presentations and discussions may produce new insights, ideas and options, most importantly on how to successfully overcome persisting challenges in the region. This is of fundamental importance to the people living in the region, as well as to, to all of us. In that sense, I wish you interesting, lively, and mutually beneficial discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you for the support you and the Swiss government provide us for this critical program. Very much appreciated. Um, and now, Rosaria Pudizi, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Rosaria, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Perfect pronunciation. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you today. I'm a great fan of the Rose Road Seminar and I've um, sat as a, um, a part of the public uh, for a long time, so I'm happy to be here with you. Um, my role today is to give you an overview of uh, the Alliance engagement in the South Caucasus. Um, let me start by telling you that, uh, in my view, NATO uh, engagement in the South Caucasus is a, a vivid testimony of the fact that uh, our partnership policy is demand-driven and tailored to the level of ambition of each country. Rosaria, excuse me to interrupt. Uh, excuse me to interrupt. The sound quality is not great. If you maybe don't mind speaking a little bit slower, and maybe um, yeah, maybe that'll that'll work. Yes, let's try. Okay, let me let me try again. Does it work better? It is a little better, but uh, yeah, if you could maybe maybe what would also help if you could speak a, a little bit slower. Let's try. Okay, yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, so NATO engagement in the South Caucasus is a vivid testimony of the fact that our partnership policy is demand-driven and tailored to the level of ambition of each country. Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan have different priorities and perspectives in their, in their interaction with the alliance, ranging from Georgia's membership aspirations 
to Azerbaijan and Armenians' sustained participation in Partnership for Peace. As the NATO summit uh, communique reiterates, NATO recognizes that conflict and pervasive instability in its neighborhood has a direct impact on allied security. The alliance is therefore determined to strengthen its ability to provide training and capacity building support to partners. With 16 ongoing initiatives and all allies plus partner Finland and Sweden involved, the substantial NATO-Georgia package, SNGP, is a flagship of NATO's capacity building support to partners. This is a unique program of which we are very proud. Through it, NATO and Georgia are working together side by side on a daily basis to consolidate Georgia's capabilities and prepare Georgia to its goal of becoming a member of the alliance. The SNGP is one of the instruments we refer to when we remind our Georgian friends that they have all the tools to prepare for membership. In Armenia and Azerbaijan, our engagement continues mainly through the planning and review process. And the support for selected units of the respective armed forces to work together with NATO and to participate in NATO operations and missions. Um, all our three South Caucasian partners have contributed in different measures to NATO missions. And we are grateful to all for the sacrifices and costs that they have borne as a result. Particularly, Georgia has been involved with the alliance in Afghanistan since, since day one, and has offered one of the largest per capita contributions in terms of personnel. We will see in the course of this Rose Rose webinar to which extent the regional security scenario has changed in the aftermath of last autumn's Karabakh war. NATO remains nonetheless committed to engage with partners in the South Caucasus as much as they wanted to keep engaging with us. While Georgia, um, while with Georgia we are on a solid path that will uh, eventually lead to membership, as firmly asserted at uh, every NATO summit since Bucharest in 2008, We've also received indications that Armenia and Azerbaijan remain interested in working with NATO. Our approach stays demand-driven and tailor-made. The Alliance has made it very clear that overall, partnerships are and will continue to be essential to the way NATO works. They are central to advancing NATO's uh, cooperative security agenda. They help to shape our security environment, and they contribute to stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. The Alliance is committed to expand political dialogue and practical cooperation with any nation that shares the Alliance's values and interests in international peace and security. This principle applies, of course, also to the South Caucasus. And with uh, this, I think I will uh, leave my uh, NATO liaison office uh, hat and wear my hat as moderator of uh, uh, this uh, um, webinar. Um, uh, and let me repeat that this is a great pleasure um, to be here with you uh, today. I see that uh, President Connolly is still there. Rosaria, I want to thank you and thank you for those thoughtful remarks. Um, as I indicated, unfortunately, I'm going to have to sign off because I'm doing a NATO program with uh, the uh, Bundestag uh, under the auspices of the German Marshall Fund uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so I'm going to have to uh, get off to do that. Um, but I, I just wanted to stress the very last point you made. We do keep our doors open and we do welcome new participation and partnerships, but we share common democratic values. And to me, that is a cardinal principle that must be met by any would-be aspirant 
and must be enforced within the alliance itself. Uh, and uh, we're going to be working to create a, a Center for Democratic Resilience within NATO itself as part of the uh, re renewed strategic concept uh, process uh, that is underway now and will get fully underway in September. Uh, so thank you for your leadership and thank you for agreeing to moderate today's session. Uh, and uh, I wish everybody uh, good luck today. Thank you. Thank you to you and uh, a very good day to you as well. So um, let's uh, then get engaged uh, uh, with uh, uh, the participants uh, in this panel. Uh, of course, I, we are looking at the whole region as I mentioned, but it's uh, impossible to avoid uh, the single event that last year had to a certain point, from a certain point of view, been a, a, a very clear game changer. Um, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, last autumn has been a tragedy from uh, a humanitarian perspective and a game changer um, in political and geopolitical terms. Uh, one striking conclusion that emerged from the last the vast uh, uh, literature that has been produced uh, throughout the years uh, on uh, uh, the Karabakh conflict is that, in fact, this is uh, one conflict rolled, uh, uh, three conflicts rolled in one. It's first an ethnic conflict uh, localized in the Nagorno-Karabakh, nested in an interstate conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, nested in a wider geopolitical struggle for influence between regional and international powers. So during this panel discussion, um, and thanks to uh, an excellent uh, group of uh, speakers, uh, we will have an opportunity to explore um, the uh, intertwining of these three layers um, and the impact that the changes that have intervened since last autumn have on the region at large. Uh, of course, we could uh, have no better speaker to open this uh, discussion than Thomas Deval. Thomas is a, a senior fellow with um, Carnegie Europe, um, and he has been working for years on the Caucasus. His book, Black Garden, Armenia and Azerbaijan Through Peace and War, is the book on the Karabakh conflict, especially on its um, early stages. But he has also written extensively on uh, the Caucasus uh, uh, in uh, uh, wider uh, terms. Um, and this includes uh, um, the, the Caucasus and Introduction, uh, a, a book that has been republished uh, recently um, uh, by uh, Oxford University Press. So, um, Thomas, let me leave the floor to you. Um, and uh, um, to introduce uh, this uh, very difficult uh, um, uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosaria. Uh, greetings from London. I hope you can see and hear me properly. <laughs> I'm talking to you. Very well, very well. Thank you. Um, talking, I'm very... I'm very glad indeed for this uh, invitation uh, to talk to you today. I'm aware that time is fairly limited, so I will try and um, if, if I go beyond 15 minutes, please do shut me up. Um, so thank you for this uh, very warm invitation to speak to the Rose Roth seminar. And actually, this is not the first time um, that I have given a keynote address to the Rose Roth seminar. And I'm afraid this shows my age a little that I did so last in September 2002 uh, in Tbilisi. And I thought it was the text of that um, uh, presentation is still um, published. I can I can share it with anyone who's interested. So I, I, as, a, as an interesting exercise, I decided to have a look at that text and, and compare the situation in 2002 and my thoughts on it then to the situation in 2021. My theme... Um, was insecurity in the Caucasus. Um, and um, I, I'm, unfortunately, that's a, a theme which is still relevant today. So it was useful and also a bit, I must, I have to admit, a little depressing to, to look at that presentation from 2002, where I, I, I identified three key sources of insecurity in the South Caucasus. Um, the first one 
was the legacy of the conflicts of the 1990s, their continued lack of resolution, and to my mind, a lack of creativity in finding peaceful uh, solutions for them on, on all sides, I, I have to say. The second source of insecurity was um, the fact that the monopoly of violence in this region had been subcontracted to informal armed groups all too often. Um, in particular, I mentioned uh, the destabilizing effect of violence from the North Caucasus um, and from Chechnya in particular. And my third theme about insecurity in the South Caucasus was um, what I termed, I guess, inconsistent policy making from um, the outsiders to this region. And I also highlighted the fact the lack of a regional approach, the fact that the South Caucasus exists on the map uh, as a region, but in terms of its security architecture, indeed, indeed in terms of its um, economic cooperation, um, is, is not really a region. It's more, unfortunately, a place of, of closed borders, insecurities and, and, and confrontations. So today, as we speak in 2021, the first problem, um, the legacy of the conflicts um, that accompanied the end of the Soviet Union, persists, uh, indeed, unfortunately, has, in many ways, I would say, has worsened. Um, back in 2002, let me give you a quote, I compared the security situation in the Caucasus to a house after a moderately bad earthquake, which was still habitable, but rather dangerous, rather precarious. I warned, however, to an outsider, it is obvious that the home is damaged and dangerous, and with another earthquake, the whole structure could collapse again. So that was in two, talking 2002. Unfortunately, and, and I wasn't the only one warning this, more conflict um, unfortunately followed in subsequent years uh, in South Ossetia, uh, as we know in August, uh, the five-day war, uh, Georgia-Russia war of 2008. And then as, we, uh, as we're all reminded, and we will, I'm sure, talk quite extensively about today, the war um, of 2020, the 44-day war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Karabakh, the Second Karabakh War. So a new earthquake did indeed happen, and thousands, unfortunately, thousands more lives uh, were lost. So I'll return to this theme in general, but let, let me talk a little about my second um, issue, uh, the one about the subcontracting of violence to informal armed groups. Well, in, in that one, I think the story is a little more positive. I think that's the most uh, positive feature um, looking back almost uh, 20 years on, there has been progress there. That that certainly was a, a theme of, of, of that era, that um, the armed forces um, of these uh, three countries um, lacked proper professionalism and formal structures. And there I think we have seen um, more progress, the consolidation of those three countries as nation states, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. Their armed forces and, um, and security services are much more professional, and, and I think we should give uh, credit to NATO for the job it's done in assisting uh, that process through many uh, training programs. Indeed, um, Georgia uh, has gone, as it's already been mentioned, has made the transition not from being a security recipient, um, which it still is, obviously, to also being a security provider in, in Afghanistan. I, I think something we should pay great tribute to, to the way that that small country has provided such a large and extended commitment um, to the NATO uh, presence in Afghanistan. So the threat that was posed for many years by informal militias and paramil paramilitary forces has receded. Much more reform is needed, um, but the kind of spontaneous political violence that was a feature um, of, of these countries in the 1990s um, is no longer such a problem um, um, today. And, and, and that's, that's I, I think, a positive. Um, but it's also, I think, worth mentioning uh, the North Caucasus. And it's interesting to look back at my text of 2002 and to see how much the North Caucasus figured as a theme in that presentation. So it's worth recalling uh, that 20 years ago, um, there was a lot of focus on the overspill of violence from Chechnya and also from Dagestan. Um, there was uh, a lot of attention on the Pankisi Gorge, the Pankisi Valley uh, in Georgia, uh, as a source of instability. This also followed 
this um, some you know terrorists. Um, I think a small number, but but there were some were identified as having their origin in that region, as indeed have some people who've since gone to Syria. So th those were big themes back then. Um, I think the situation now is much more stable in that regard, but I also think that we should be not be complacent. The underlying problems of the North Caucasus remain, and those are alienation from the Russian centre, poverty, unemployment, and the appeal of radical Islam as an alternative ideology uh, for people who do not see much hope uh, of a future. I think those problems have been suppressed rather than resolved, and unfortunately, I think they are likely to resurface in some form in the future and, as a result, pose some problems for the South Caucasus as well. And, and just to remind those of you who haven't seen the news, just last week, uh, President Putin endorsed uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, who is the rather terrifying leader of Chechnya, who is still only 44 years old, um, for uh, another term in office. And Kadyrov, under various titles, has been the leader of Chechnya since 2006. Now to turn to the third issue, which is the sporadic and inconsistent interest of the great powers. Well, I think this is a, a theme throughout history of this region. We should not be shocked that this region, with all its complexities and contradiction, you know, attracts uh, outside interest rather intermittently, um, depending on what else is going on the war, on in the world, depending. Uh, on the interests of the great powers, the, the three surrounding great powers, uh, which were both, which were all three um, imperial powers, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, throughout the history of this region, and also the United States, European Union, and we could even mention um, China. So I think this um, problem still persists, and I don't think will will ever be solved, because this is such a, a complex region where so many interests are at stake. But I would still make a plea in this setting, as I do in talking to the EU, United States, for a more joined up, a more consistent uh, approach amongst different arms of government to try and think a little more about, a little more strategically about the future of this region. Um, and it's true, undoubtedly, that um, the European Union is now a major player in Georgia as never before. And that the United States has done invested an enormous amount also in Georgia and is is now Georgia's major security patron. But I think there's still um, a sad story really about about how um, the security architecture of this region is not complete. Um, I think one sad story here is the failure and disappointment with the OSCE, um, an organisation which in the early 1990s there were great hopes for um, to be a security organization for Europe. And for many reasons, that has not uh, come to pass. Um, I'm not blaming the OSC itself. Um, I'm really talking about um, objective reasons why that isn't the case. Um, the, the OSC is not even formally an international organization. It's still a kind of conference uh, which meets on a permanent basis. It has rather a weak executive compared to, to the United Nations, for example. The veto principle means that one small state um, can veto um, quite significant action. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan ha have done so um, with, I think, some negative effects for OSC operations. The budget is quite small. Um, I'm, I'm just checking this morning. In 2019, the budget was 138 million euros, which is only 5% of the budget of the United Nations. And also relevant to the Karabakh uh, conflict. One of the ma main reasons that, that this conflict um, could never be solved internationally was that there was never really a, a very strong commitment to have a peacekeeping force there. Formerly, there was supposed to be a OSCE peacekeeping force that was promised in, back in 1994. But as we know, the OSCE never developed a peacekeeping capacity. So that's another problem. The, the operation in Ukraine, which is separately funded, is not strictly a, a peacekeeping operation. It, it's, it's a kind of strong monitoring operation. So let me just turn now to, to the recent war in Karabakh, um, which is, as, as has already been mentioned, a great human tragedy, around 8,000 lives lost, mostly to young men who hadn't even been born when the first Karabakh war 
uh, was forward back in the 1990s. There are still missing. There are um, positive outcomes to this conflict, particularly when it comes to the um, for Azerbaijan, particularly the um, right of return for more than one more than half a million Azerbaijanis who lost their homes back in the 1990s when the Armenians occupied uh, the seven regions around seven districts around Karabakh. Uh, they now have, um, for the first time in more than 25 years, the right of return. This is very positive, um, and although it will take many years for them to return, but there are also, unfortunately, new displaced uh, from the war, around 30,000 uh, Armenians. So um, we can discuss, I think, all day what caused this new conflict, but one region, reason for sure is, is a, a certain Western disengagement from um, the region and from this conflict in particular. Um, I think many people are to blame here, but I think it's worth saying that both Armenia and Azerbaijan had, since 1994, many opportunities to embrace uh, an internationally brokered peace, um, which would have involved a peacekeeping force, a fairly equitable uh, mechanisms to address justice issues, um, and, you know, a a sharing uh, of the problem of, of Nagorno-Karabakh. That didn't happen. Each side remained, I think, very inflexible. Uh, the Armenian side, um, you, you, um, the occupied territories around Karabakh that I've heard were frequently referred to as liberated territories in Armenia, which giving the Azerbaijan is the sense that Armenian side would never give them up, even if this was said maybe sometimes um, in private negotiations. And the Azerbaijani side um, was full of very aggressive rhetoric um, and did not give much hope to the Armenians of Karabakh um, that it would talk to them or uh, respect their rights and aspirations. Both sides, I think, um, do have to face up to the fact they were very inflexible. And if there wasn't an international peace, um, they need to look um, at their own responsibility for why that did not happen and why it was Russia um, who stepped in because Russia had the will, um, the men, the firepower, and, and the speed to intervene um, to uh, in this conflict, but of obviously on Russia's terms back last year. So um, the November ceasefire, as, um, which um, certainly halted the fighting, um, after great human tragedy. It did, as I said, give some hope or return for uh, Azerbaijani uh, IDPs, but it did um, bring in a new kind of Russian order into this region for the first time um, since the um, collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, there are 50 Turkish observers, but in, in a rather secondary role, um, monitoring the ceasefire and not close to Karabakh itself. Um, there are Many issues about this ceasefire. There's no formal mandate for the peacekeeping force. Um, it's more of, in a sense, of a statement um, than a formal agreement. That the agreement has not been ratified internationally or endorsed by the United Nations or the OSCE. Um, the Minsk group of the OSCE continues, um, but um, it's still rather, uh, I would say, a weak format addressing an almost impossible issue. Rosaria, are you about to tell me my time is up? Is that correct? Um, um, I, I'll, I'll, why, why don't I just um, briefly make a, a couple of concluding remarks and anything else um, we can return to in the Q&A. Just to say, I, um, I think, unfortunately, despite much progress in many areas, particularly, in, I think, in economic and governance areas, there is a, still a big security vacuum in this region, which the OSC has not addressed which Russia does not address, and which NATO, for objective reasons, is, is unable to um, address either. Um, so it's my view, really, that um, in the security sector, we're looking very much at stabilization um, um, of this region. There's no single international formula for, for stabilizing the security situation. But hopefully, um, on the e in the economic field and development field, there is more that can be done to strengthen and regional cooperation. Uh, there are some new opportunities now after the, the latest conflict uh, to do that. And hopefully this um, economic agenda can um, help, which is still rather a weak one, can, can, can help build uh, a peace uh, agenda 
uh, in this region. But let me stop there so there's, there's, there's time for the other speakers and for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. I, I hope that the sound is better than it was before. Um, thank you, Thomas. This is a, a fantastic um, way to introduce the, the discussion. Um, and to use your metaphor, I think that with uh, our fellow um, panel participants, um, our objective would be to understand today um, how sound is that house that has been shaken up by another earthquake. Um, so we have three speakers from the three different countries of the South Caucasus. They will um, uh, probably tease out uh, some of the same elements that you have uh, brought to the front. So let me give the floor uh, to, um, to start with uh, to uh, Tengiz Khalaz. Uh, Tengiz uh, is, uh, uh, has a huge uh, experience, uh, both as uh, an academic and uh, as a policymaker. Um, uh, I have uh, known him in both capacities. When I arrived in Georgia, he was uh, uh, the foreign policy uh, advisor of uh, the then uh, uh, president uh, of Georgia, and he has uh, um, played that role for four years between 2014 and 2018. At the moment, is a senior fellow at the European Center for International Political uh, Economy, but he has also worked a lot with civil society. So with this experience, he embraces all different aspects of Georgian and regional um, uh, society uh, and will uh, help us understand where the main points and whether there are actually also reasons for hope in this new scenario that has uh, uh, been outlined. And uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosaria. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. That's my pleasure and privilege to be uh, today among you and uh, offer some thoughts about uh, ongoing development and security challenges in the South Caucasus region. At the same time, uh, let me thank Tom DeWall. He definitely my, made my job easier. Uh, so let me start with the point that this year marks 30th anniversary of collapse of Soviet Union and restoration of independence of South Caucasus nations. Some 30 years ago, Soviet times left to Europe. The end of Cold War brought better future for hundreds of million people around the globe. The idea of Europe whole, free, and in peace almost became true. Almost since it has not been accomplished in full. At the same time as most Central and Eastern European countries were liberated, Georgia people fought the war for their freedom and independence. And today, 30 years later, we are still in that battle. Today, 30 years later, we are still talking about dividing lines in Europe. 30 years later, we are talking about spheres of privileged interest and front lines. 30 years later, we are witnessing occupation and annexation of European countries. 30 years later, we are facing new Cold War and new confrontation paradigm in Europe. It's so hard to believe, but every nation around Russia that chose democratic and Western development is under danger. Those 30 years are also indicated that our common security is so weak, early warning and threat prevention mechanisms are insufficient while conflict resolution requires new approaches, courage, creativity and strategic vision. The international community reacts to the individual cases of violation of sovereignty, but unified strategy that ensures free choice of, and sovereignty of nations have not been created yet. We have so many ceasefire agreements, but no peace treaties. We have mechanisms to freeze conflicts, but not solutions. However, all those threats and challenges are interconnected. Hybrid warfare technologies that have been used against Georgia since 90s now are advanced, became more sophisticated. Now 
they are directed against the member states. And today we are talking on malign influence of propaganda, psychological or informational operations, cyber attacks, and meddling in election campaigns, not only NATO partner countries, but NATO member states. Such confrontation paradigm is harmful and it has to be changed. I often heard question if Georgia's integration into NATO escalates already complicated and sensitive security environments. However, to recall the history of NATO enlargement, it's obvious that countries with occupied territories and disputed borders we are accepted into alliance. That led us to a reunification of Germany, enlargement of alliance, and as an impact, NATO and its new members benefited as well as Russia Federation did, because skeptical about enlargement, Russia Federation got more secure borders and stable and reliable neighbors and partners. So our aspiration is never against any country, nor additional threat to your Atlantic security. Secure Georgia can offer more opportunity to enhance international security and cooperation. Firmly standing Georgia is the guarantee of strength and ties between the Black Sea and Caspian region, enhanced partnership between Europe and Asia in political, economic, trade, and cultural terms. Georgia has contributed to regional peace and security. We also managed to play an important role in the first confidence-building measure of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Tbilisi's effort we are recently rewarded with Azerbaijani releasing 15 detailed Armenians in exchange for Armenia's map of anti-tank and anti-personal mines. Georgia's contribution to peace in Nagorno-Karabakh demonstrates its vital role as a steadfast NATO ally promoting peace and security in Europe's East. And we are ready to be the platform and the place of negotiations and cooperations and facilitations. When NATO calls on its allies for military support, Georgia is the first to respond. Years in and years out, Georgia has made valuable contributions to the international missions in Kosovo, Iraq, Central Africa, Mali, or Afghanistan. Despite sacrifices in conflict, public and bipartisan political support for Georgia's NATO integration remains still very high. Georgia's Democratic Republic is very young, but our statehood counts centuries. We know the price of partnership, and we are thankful to common interest and values. The better future for our region at large is in cooperation, trade, dialogue, and peaceful development. And Georgia is a vital part of this context, located in a critical nexus of geostrategic region that bridges east and west and north with south. We have opened our territory to this cooperation. Therefore, safeguarding Georgia equals protecting economic opportunities, European markets, and access to Asian resources. So 19 years ago, Georgia officially applied for NATO membership. 13 years ago, Alliance committed that Georgia will become its member. In 2014, Georgia was recognized as enhanced capabilities partners, highly interoperable with NATO. In 2016, NATO stated that Georgia has all practical tools to prepare for membership. On its NATO path, Georgia has established its democratic credentials. Georgia allocates 2% of its GDP on defense with proportion of 20% of defense spending on ma major acquisitions. Together with the allies, we have made excellent progress on substantial NATO-Georgia package and ongoing different reform will further increase the combat readiness, resilience, and ensure high mobility of our armed forces. However, we know that that's not enough, and we need more efforts, better performance, and better results. We're not perfect, but who is perfect today? We all have our ups and downs, success and failures. Georgian government and opposition have so many internal disputes and contradictions we civil society activists also often criticize our government demanding more reforms and better performance but when it comes to georgia's path towards nato we all are united so our goal is to be prepared for the window of opportunity however we don't look our membership to the alliance for granted 
window of opportunity must be created and crafted by us. And that process required lots of effort, tireless work, and very close coordination with our allies. Today, we still need the same spirit of unity that once defeated the Cold War, a victory that was achieved through firm leadership and commitment. We need to win the war without fight. And finally, let me thank you all for your attention and interest to Georgia and so Caucasus regions. I would like to thank organizers of this webinar, Secretariat of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and of course, NATO Liaison Office uh, to Georgia. I do believe that such discussions are essential to our cooperation, that makes us coherent to elaborate new opportunities, think unthinkable and crowd window of opportunity for our better future, security and prosperity. I will stop here and I'm ready for your question. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Tengiz. Um, thank you for bringing in uh, the Georgian uh, dimension. Uh, Georgia is, of course, uh, um, a country that has contributed so much to the um, international security. Uh, it's a country that has a very special role in the Caucasus, uh, and uh, you correctly reminded uh, all of us uh, uh, the facilitation that uh, was played, uh, offered by, by Georgia for the release of uh, uh, the um, uh, Armenian uh, uh, prisoners. Um, so um, Georgia is a very important uh, player, and it has a huge uh, potential, uh, not only in this region, but in wider terms. Um, let's uh, move uh, to Armenia with our uh, next uh, uh, speaker. Um, uh, Talim Papazian is uh, a political scientist um, and uh, a lecturer at the University of uh, Aix uh, uh, and Marseille. Uh, she uh, complements her rich uh, academic uh, uh, career with uh, policy-making experience um, in 2018, 2019, she was uh, a foreign-based senior expert in the Armenian Ministry of Defense, and she currently manages the non-profit organization Armenia Peace Initiative, through which she engages in civil society projects uh, throughout the South Caucasus. Uh, Talib, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rosaria, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, first, let me express my uh, gratitude for this opportunity to engage with you all and with the colleagues from the uh, two other uh, South Caucasian um, states. Uh, also, let me uh, emphasize that I'm speaking uh, in personal capacity. I'm not representing uh, neither Armenia nor any uh, special organization um, of any kind from the diaspora. Um, I will make three points uh, in the 10 minutes that I have today. Uh, first is um, what kind of world order and failures of world order uh, have been exposed as a result of the NK 2020 war. The second point um, will be where we are now with the NK conflict and what kind of security challenges do we have regarding Armenia and Azerbaijan and the region at large. And uh, my third point uh, will be to try um, to maybe suggest or um, um, together give uh, food for thought on how we can work from where we are now. Um, so whatever post-Soviet world order we had or we thought we had uh, before the NK 2020 um, did not work. And that war, in a way, exposed the failure uh, of that world order. We may even have today the impression that we are reverting to an old Cold War paradigm. But uh, of course, um, the US is no longer a hegemon. Uh, we are not in the 1990s anymore. And even though we may have features of Cold War type, uh, I think those features are rather magnified by the absence of a new world order for a real multipolar world um, and not really accounting for new regional and international trends. The 
Currently, rules of engagement are blurred and um, moral values of cooperation and democratization have been badly challenged uh, throughout the year 2020 in the South Caucasus and beyond. Um, we are witnessing rise of regional powers that act on their own, sometimes without regard for others nor compliance for their international obligations. During the NK 2020, F-16s were flying a few dozens kilometers away from the North Caucasus border of Dagestan. Um, as a result of that war, Turkey has gained a proxy presence in Azerbaijan in addition to Central Asia. We have a, a possible threat of the northern border of Iran uh, at, at, at the border with Armenia. And let me remind the audience that border had been settled by the end of uh, Persian and Russian military confrontations in the 19th century, so when the empires agreed on their final settlement of their borders. And finally, Russia has gained unprecedented presence in Azerbaijan and has also strengthened its grip on Armenia uh, enormously. So uh, we are in danger of rising international tensions uh, being reflected in the region. And uh, these certainly does not uh, need more attention. Regional powers are being assertive outside their post-Soviet backyards. And in that respect, the South Caucasus region is at risk of becoming a place of competing larger players. And I would add once more in its history. And if that trend is not moderated, not uh, alleviated by multilateral cooperative mechanisms, this may be a highly destabilizing factor for all the peoples of the South Caucasus. So where, we are, where are we now, sorry, with the NK conflict and security challenges regarding Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the region at large? We have separate sets of issues. We have issues pertaining to the NK conflict and issues pertaining to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the larger region. Uh, the 2020 Karabakh war may have resolved problems, problems uh, Azerbaijan had, but it also created new problems. Uh, the first one is Russian interposition troops that are currently the only security guarantee to Artsakh Armenians. Second point is that uh, the NK conflict was always a conflict between two international principles uh, that I'm not going to um, uh, re re remind you because I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but the right of Karabakh Armenians to live securely and safely on their lands needs to be addressed maybe with some temporary measures now and then working as uh, Tom DeWall said and as Tengiz said, uh, more creatively for future long-term solutions. We have new cohorts of refugees from NK temporarily resettled in Armenia and in other areas of Artsakh. And let me finish by saying that absence of war is not peace, as we have seen uh, during the last 30 years, it certainly is not peace. That conflict was not only a conflict of interests, it also is uh, a conflict of identities. And we need to acknowledge that we have heavy problems of rhetoric and stereotypes in both places. At the magnitude and consequences of institutionalized armenophobia in Azerbaijan largely outweighs the effects of cultural stereotypes that may be running in the Armenian society. So where are Armenia Azerbaijan now? Um, if we take as uh, our starting point the November 10th ceasefire statement, there are many ambiguities uh, in that statement, and there, are, there is also a lot of room for less for more. One thing, however, was not ambiguous, is that all prisoners of wars and captives uh, shall and were explicitly asked to be returned. Um, and yes, there has been this very welcome and appreciated intervention of Georgia just two weeks ago uh, to help um, find converging interests between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I would like to see that as a first but not certainly not last um, instance of that sort of, um, let's say, um, awareness of converging interests. Second point, borders of Armenia and Azerbaijan will be worked out. Uh, there is no other way. But manners matter, and uh, encroachments on the territory of the Republic of Armenia is not only unacceptable, but it also does not bode well for genuine peace prospects. 
placing border areas inhabitants under conditions of economic and physical pressure is obviously not a good sign for future peace. Eventually, one can see that priority is put on communication and economic unblocking of the region. Here again, I want to say that economic enticement is not enough and that it needs parallel political steps to become substantial reality. So how do we work from there? We have the issue of normalizing relations with Azerbaijan. This can be done two ways. It can be done either by creating genuine conditions for, as I said earlier, converging interests to be visible to all parties interested, or it can be done by compelling Armenia to bow to the will of the victor indefinitely, and thus creating new reasons of hostility. So far, Moscow has the upper hand. But the peoples of the South Caucasus should have by now gained enough historical memories of that sort of peacemaking to know better. Moscow is a key partner both for Armenia and Azerbaijan, but direct discussions in order to make out what will be the future of the region are necessary to. Next issue is the question of what happened to Islamist mercenaries that were brought to the region. There has been no proper handling of this issue. Where are they now? And how do we deal with that regional threat to security of the Caucasus? Next point, international mediation must be resolved. Major powers might be resolving their own problems in the region, but by doing so, if they are becoming part of the problem rather than the solution, then obviously it will create additional problems. In time, there might be a need for a new Eurasian security architecture or maybe for a more comprehensive approach to um, the South Caucasus region needs. Finally, I want to say that the South Caucasus is currently only a geographic concept. I think Tom DeWall said that in his speech, and I fully agree. And it should turn into a political one. The three states should start working together, looking at the region and, uh, and at each other in order to secure their own sovereignty, I would say, once and for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Celine, you've highlighted uh, so many issues, and I'm sure that some of them will come back uh, in the uh, conversation. Um, I myself am very interested also in the domestic dynamics, both in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and how they can um, affect uh, the uh, further steps in hopefully getting to um, a settlement um, or, or regulation of the conflict. But we've got uh, um, Kavusa Bushov uh, with us now, uh, so we will hear um, what is the mood in Baku, what are the Azerbaijani perspectives uh, on the conflict. Um, I'm very grateful um, to Kavus for joining us uh, today. He is also uh, an academic as our previous speakers. He is uh, um, uh, Associate Professor at the Azerbaijan uh, uh, Diplomatic uh, uh, Academy. Um, his research interests include the security studies, ethnic civil wars, political economy and state building, and he has uh, an extensive list of publications on this topic, uh, topics uh, including uh, uh, something that is uh, particularly meaningful for this uh, uh, um, issue that we are addressing today, and it's uh, um, a co-authored book on self-determination and secession in international law, and this is published uh, by Oxford University Press. Um, uh, Kavus, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, interesting introduction. Um, my speech is going to be probably the most positive out of the uh, panelists sort of uh, on the on the conflict and on the region. Um, but since you mentioned the textbook, or not the textbook, but the book on secession and self-determination, um, I would be, there, there was a point raised by my colleague uh, uh, Papazian, Miss Papazian, about the tension or the conflict between two principles, uh, which means, uh, right, sort of the territorial sovereignty of states and secession. I think that was not uh, accurate, and there's a lot of literature on that. I would be more than happy to share that literature with Ms. Papazian, because there's there's sometimes misinterpretation of those things in, 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 in the press overall, but not in literature, and expertise is quite clear on that. Okay, um, 
let me start my presentation or my speech by saying that um, the military phase of the conflict is tragically over. And I'm emphasizing two things, tragically and over. That means, similar to a security community, the concept of a security community in Europe, for example, one cannot imagine a war between the, uh, between the member states of the European Union. Because European Union is a security community, that means an integrated uh, community of states. Uh, now, war has largely become unlikely and unrealistic between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I'm talking about a future war. So the, 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 the November war was, in a way, a victim to ending up everything. And that ended up the military phase of the conflict. Now, why I, I, I think this way, I'll explain in a minute. Um, if you look at the last, uh, I mean, the last 10 years, or more than 10 years since the 1994 ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan, how many soldiers have died in the sporadic skirmishes? That is absent. So sporadic skirmishes are not happening. You see border issues, but these border issues are not really uh, spilling over to a large military tension. So um, I'm, I'm firm on this point that the military phase of the conflict is over. And that is uh, due to two factors primarily. One is the role of Russia, that is the hegemonic piece of Russia. So the conflict parties take Russia, both Armenia and Azerbaijan take Russia very, very serious. And Russia is committed to stabilizing the situation. Unlike in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, here Russia has played a positive role, I think. Um, it depends, of course, from which angle we look. But uh, the conflict parties have also themselves, by and large, achieved what they wanted. So, so, so there's no need for another, for another uh, military, military phase of the conflict. And I also mentioned that the military phase is tragically over. Now, from now on, the long-awaited political phase of the conflict um, has come, or is coming. Um, why is it a tragedy? Well, any war is a tragedy, but this war, this uh, November war, was particularly a tragedy. And why? Because I think um, the, 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 the state's call, the, the state's call, uh, the result of the, of the war, might have been achieved without any sacrifice of human life. Um, let me tell you that I've attended the, the peace process myself at track two level, yes, and I've also attended the peace process with the Minsk group uh, twice, at least twice, and I had colleagues from Armenia, um, sort of from the Armenian academia, um, Armenian, uh, how to say, uh, NGOs, although they were a minority, but they understood the situation quite well, and we were doing our best to avoid what happened, yes. So we were trying. We were trying to assure that it was so easy to achieve what what, what has been achieved today without any any sacrifice of human life. But as as for a number of reasons, for a number of uh, insecurity dilemmas, for a number of uh, reasons, also mentioned by Thomas Deval, uh, the the lack of commitment of the West. Uh, the West had been ignorant of this conflict since. Uh, the, uh, since 1996, there had been no pressure, no substantial pressure on Armenia since the Lisbon summit of the OSC to withdraw from the occupied regions outside Nagorno-Karabakh. The situation had become really, really acute, and uh, it, was, it was moving towards the war. So, um, and the tragedy element is that things will definitely normalize between the conflict parties. Let's wait. If you don't trust me or believe me, let's wait for five years. And in five years' time, we'll see that relations will be normalizing between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The enmity will be deconstructed, but the fallen, so the fallen soldiers will not be coming back. And that makes it a tragedy. Um, as I mentioned, it is now expected that the beginning of a political process will start. And... Here, the emphasis in the political process is less on Nagorno-Karabakh rather than Armenia-Azerbaijan relations. And why I'm confident about it, I'm confident about it for a number of reasons, one of which also includes the election of Nikol Pashinyan's party in Armenia, because uh, that sheds further hope in the peace process. Yes, before uh, there were a number of voices, radical voices in Armenia calling for revenge, calling for a new war, calling for... Uh, uh, new buying new arms from from Russia and so on and forth, um, and I always had concerns if if they came to power. But Nikol Pashinyan's party has a pragmatic approach. 
Now, you may ask the question, but wasn't it Nikol Pashinyan's party who actually led the war? Yes, but actually it would be wrong to blame everything on Pashinyan as his as uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan, as he, he's, he mentioned this, he, cl he cleared it up uh, very clearly in an article that he had published in the aftermath of the war. So what will happen next is probably the likelihood is that there will be an agreement on the delimitation of the borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Next, there will be restoration of communication, including political communication, uh, also between Turkey and Armenia. And that will be followed by a comprehensive peace agreement, uh, not now, but in probably two, three years' time, a comprehensive peace agreement in which both parties will be recognizing each other's territorial sovereignty. As to Nagorno-Karabakh itself and its status, I think there can be certain uh, many variants, uh, many, many options taken from international experience, uh, form of cult cultural autonomy and other forms. And I think the Azerbaijani government is quite positive on this. President Ilham Aliyev has a number of times repeatedly stated that Karabakh Armenians are nationals of Azerbaijan. We are ready uh, to understand and to take into consideration their security concerns. And uh, well, he's also emphasized the need for, for, for integration in the region. Uh, the solution to long-term peace comes through integration. And there, I think uh, the reference that he was making was to the European process of, of, of integration and that started in 1950s and resolved all the security uh, problems there. Um, now, on Russia's role, uh, I think one difference between Russia's role in other countries, particularly in Georgia and in Ukraine, one fundamental difference is that Russia's, it's not excluded that Russia will be playing a very positive role in this conflict. Russia has repeatedly, since the ceasefire, emphasized that it wants the status issue to be, to be melting down in a process of trust building and confidence building. So in a way, we see a happy Russia, a Russia satisfied with the results. Uh, uh, the, the key result or the key interest is security, political, mil military presence in the region, which Russia has assured now through the peacekeeping force in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. That is, I believe, uh, on a long-term basis. I don't think it's, 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 it's envisaged for a short-term basis. But that does not really exclude resolution of the conflict. The presence of Russian peacekeeping force does not say the resolution of the conflict or final settlement of the conflict. Uh, is impossible. So I think we we can see a slight distinction between Russia's role played, negative role played in Abkhazia and South Ossetia uh, and in Ukraine and to a certain extent Moldova and in this conflict. Um, that is so much positive. Uh, now let me switch to the problems. Uh, as of today there are still a few, a few, not many, but a few unresolved issues between the conflict parties and these include the maps of the uh, landmines laid by Armenian forces, armed forces in Azerbaijani territory. Um, I would like to remind that some of these landmines were actually laid um, after the 10th of November uh, ceasefire uh, uh, in, in regions like Kalbajar and Lachan uh, that were adjacent to Armenia. And as a result of these landmine explosions, uh, 40 people have died. Now, why I'm emphasizing this, because that makes it slightly difficult to start the deconstruction of hatred between the societies. Um, now, uh, there are also political detainees from Armenia in Azerbaijan. Now, they're not entitled to Geneva, uh, uh, Geneva uh, Conventions, uh, protection by the Geneva Conventions. That is clear. Any international lawyer would know it. Know it. However, that doesn't mean that their status cannot be regulated. Their status needs to be regulated in a separate political process. Uh, and that means that there's, there's, there's quite a need for the restoration of political communication between the, the high-level political communication between the conflict parties. Um, and as I said, the shift of the conflict from the military phase to the pol political phase will pave the way for the normalization of relations between the societies, but that will take years because the wounds are very fresh. And when thinking back, I think Thomas Duval would be uh, on the same line with me that the, the recent war could have been avoided. Uh, and in that regard, um, it's, it's, it's really a tragic situation when a lot of young people lost their lives. Yes. 
So, uh, but there I see some culpability for the role of international mediators. It is a situation when two two people, two small boys, are fighting, and there's a there's a there's an onlooker, but the onlooker knows that the fight can be stopped, but the onlooker doesn't really care, and the boys tear each other to 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 death, and they end up in death, and then they, towards before dying they realize that they've done something very wrong. That's all I wanted to say, and I would be happy to answer your questions in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kavut. You've given us so much food for thought. And uh, I mean, on my side, I would be very interested also to understand that to which extent your very articulate, articulated thinking is uh, mm, spread uh, among the public opinion in Azerbaijan. But I hope that there will be time for further discussions. Um, I see that we have at this point in time um, six um, uh, interventions registered. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, we are already we're already uh, above time limits. Um, so I would be very grateful uh, uh, to um, uh, the members of parliament who've uh, asked uh, for the floor. Um, to limit their intervention to one minute each and possibly actually um, ask a question rather than make uh, a general uh, statement. We will take uh, three questions uh, at a time and then uh, hopefully have the opportunity to uh, give uh, the panelists another opportunity to respond because there is so much uh, in, the inter in the interventions that we've uh, uh, listened so far. So uh, first of all, I would like uh, uh, maybe, maybe uh, Andres, uh, you will help us uh, uh, manage this uh, uh, to manage this process, right? Indeed, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we now actually have seven uh, delegates uh, willing to ask the floor. Um, if you don't mind, uh, we uh, actually had some consultation uh, with with my colleagues, and if, if you don't mind, shall we take all questions in one go? I know it's a lot, but uh, but perhaps that would be time wise that would be uh, would be better. Um, we. Uh, Usually, would like to start with the with members of of um, our full delegations, uh, full members. So um, we have uh, Lord Anderson uh, on uh, on the list, uh, followed um, uh, by uh, Mr. Alexander Kirsteins from from Latvia. So, um, yeah, Lord and Lord Anderson, please. Okay. Good. Um, basically, I'd like, like to hear from Thomas as to whether he thinks that um, our last presentation was excessively optimistic. Is this, in fact, the last war, or will the earthquake, which he mentions in the House, uh, resume? Secondly, could he comment on whether um, there is a credible mediator in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan? My own uh, experiences of enormous passions on both sides. I think, for example, of the uh, the Budapest Conference of NATO, where uh, an, an Armenian was killed, and the uh, Azeri was given great honours by his government. And um, finally, that who was the winner in the conflict? That um, clearly there it has been a conflict over generations. Um, among the great powers, that has Turkey had a great victory? Has Russia appears to be the one who has achieved most? Uh, Iran possibly? Who emerges off as the dust settles with the greatest cause for celebration, apart, of course, from the Azerbaijan itself? Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, we now have on our list um, uh, Mr. Kirsteins from Latvia. Um, I saw Mr. Ahmed Yildiz from Turkey was asking for the floor. Now he is no longer on the list. I don't know if, if uh, he is no longer willing to ask a question. And if he is, I would like to ask him to click on the request to speak. So uh, Mr. Kirsteins followed by Mr. Yildiz. Uh, thank you very much, Andrews. Uh, thank you to both reporters. Latvia has very good relations. Latvia has very good relations with both with Armenia and with Azerbaijan, and uh, we are uh, go between between these two countries. But uh, because I have only technical question, I visited a short time ago in Agdam a city, and I visited in Ganja. Agdam, uh, city of 36,000 residents, was completely demolished in order to create a buffer zone between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And we were surprised that Ganja, the city located uh, 100, approximately 100 kilometers away from the combat zone, was shelled at night with rockets, destroying uh, some residential buildings and killing peaceful residents. And uh, I don't understand why did this city have to be fired with rockets and why Agdam was destroyed outside of these combat zones. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Madam Chair, we now have uh, Ahmed Yildiz uh, on, uh, on the list to be followed by, by Ms. Malahat Ibrahim Gizi from Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, Andreas. Indeed, Turkey is uh, looking forward to see the solution, to see the real peace in the region and Armenia to be part of cooperation in the region. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm uh, confused. I have mixed feelings these days. Last week, we were in the PACE, Parliament of the Parliament Assembly of the Council of Europe. On one side, Armenian MPs colleagues spoke about release of prisoners of war, something like this. Of course, Armenian side on uh, information, getting information about the landmines, which was decorated by uh, Armenia. But in the meantime, when we are talking about this, Armenian MPs came with some addresses again not recognizing the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. So this was the reason of conflict, it was in conflict for three decades, but still they talk about some vague, uh, uh, vague status, sometimes describing, for example, Shusha, which is clearly an Azerbaijan territory, as a city under occupation now. So this is not the right approach to reach a solution in any conflict. Secondly, I was surprised uh, by what I hear from Thomas about that uh, he said Az Ar Azerbaijan couldn't give hope for the citizens of uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. I remember very well several times Azerbaijan uh, said that Azerbaijan will accept, will offer anything less than separation, less than independence, when the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan is restored. So, uh, how I, I asked uh, both uh, Ar Armenian colleagues here that, how can you expect a real peace gestures from other side, while you are still questioning the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. And I appreciate the con contribution of the Georgian state, Georgian uh, guys, Georgian colleagues, to mediate somehow to address some of the issues between the two states. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, we now have uh, Ms. Ibrahim Gizi on the list, uh, followed by Mr. Uh, Kalashvili from Georgia, and uh, I would like to remind uh, that Madam Chair said the uh, suggested the time limit of one minute per question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear 
participants and the honorable colleagues. I don't have questions, but I have uh, very short uh, suggestions I would like to introduce for your attention. So uh, today, international organizations and the leading state with the future of the region in mind must work to address a number of imp important and decisive issues in the short, middle, and the, the long term. To take serious measures against the revanchist forces in Armenia and abroad. Uh, achieve the opening of the Zengezer corridor without delay. First and foremost, this would lead to solving Armenia's economic recession. To provide Azerbaijan with the mind maps of all, all the liberated territories as soon as possible. International organizations should be intensified to complete the process of demarcation and delimitation of the borders between Azerbaijan and Armenia. As you know, Azerbaijan is a multicultural, multicultural country. Even today, there are 30,000 Armenians live in Azerbaijan in peace. Recently, Armenian church was repaired and submitted to use of Armenian community in Azerbaijan. However, uh, there is still a great deal of confidence building between the two nations. Uh, I believe that international organizations, especially the institutions uh, involved in peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and the crisis management should step up their effort uh, on this important ma matter. Last but not least, international organizations and the leading states should increase their efforts to finalize great peace treatment agreement between the two countries. Thank you very much for your attention. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair. We have now Ms. Kelashvili from Georgia, followed by uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Gorgisian from Armenia. Okay, um, I hope you can see and uh, hear me. Hello. Um, uh, since, because of the request, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, I have a question to uh, Tom DeWall. Um, I'm, I was surprised to see that uh, in your three different uh, variables, so to speak, about the Caucasus, you uh, missed out uh, Russia entirely. And my question to you is uh, what you see as a trajectory of Russian actions vis-a-vis, -vis, as you said, this courted Western approach uh, to the Caucasus. Is Russian policy entirely transactional uh, and exploitative, or there are any signs, I know this is largely a rhetorical question, but still, are there any signs of any, uh, any kind of constructive engagement with the West uh, around uh, the South Caucasus? Thank you. So, Madam Chair, we now have um, our, um, uh, Mr. Gerogesian from uh, Armenia, followed by Mr. Bayramov from Azerbaijan. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. This is really important discussion, a really important topic. Uh, and my question is uh, maybe rhetorical, maybe uh, some people will, would like to answer, but now we have Azerbaijan where uh, they have some military trophy park where they show uh, Armenian soldiers, how they could be and they torture them. They have national heroes like Ramil Safarov who beheaded, who killed Armenian soldier by ex, uh, by NATO-sponsored trainings. Uh, so uh, after uh, 2016 war, they have again some national heroes that beheaded Armenian soldiers and they also were posting that photos into Facebook or some social media. During this war, they also have uh, used some non-humanitarian weapons, let's say, like phosphorus bombs and this kind of uh, other stuff. They uh, bombed uh, hospitals, they bombed schools, kindergartens, and uh, now they are destroying all Armenian heritage in the territories that is under control of Azerbaijan. Uh, our colleagues said that they have repaired the church in uh, Azerbaijan. They didn't. They just uh, removed the cross from the church and made it as a, a library. So in the situation where they, in Azerbaijan, they're trying to destroy all the Armenians 
all the Armenian heritage, all the uh, everything that is Armenian, how can be peace in this atmosphere? The hatred they have uh, since the school kindergartens in their children, the Armenophobia they have, they didn't allow anybody with Armenian surname to enter the country. And now they're keeping Armenian uh, POWs, prisoners of wars, as hostages. And uh, they keep talking about peace, they keep talking about negotiations, how it can happen. If now, until after the war ended, they're still doing this, doing armenophobic uh, policy. And even now, uh, they're still keeping POWs, and now they entered Armenian sovereign territory. More than about 1,000 of uh, Azerbaijani soldiers in Armenian territory now. But they're speaking about keeping peace. They keep speaking about uh, some negotiations. It's, it just can't work. And until now they even uh, have some fake uh, judicial processes against these POWs. They're trying to jail, they're not, now trying to, uh, to make them as terrorists, but they were kept during the war. And by all international laws, all international agreements, they are still prisoners of war. And uh, they tortured them, even some of them were killed during this torturing process. But they still keep talking about negotiation, about peace. And I think we cannot achieve any peaceful process until Azerbaijan will not re return our people there, stop their anti-Armenian, Armenophobic rhetorics. And in, in that uh, document signed on 9th of November, it says that further uh, future of Nagorno-Karabakh will be still discussed. And it, this doesn't mean that it will, it is now part of Azerbaijan. Because people who live there need security guarantees, which Azerbaijan cannot give them. And independence is only guaranteed that people living there will not be killed because they are Armenians, they believe in, uh, uh, they have other religion that Azerbaijani people have. And this is the only guarantee. Independence as a safer path for the people. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Madam Chair, we have our last speaker, uh, Mr. Bayramov. Um, he's the last speaker on the list. Um, the organizers of the event, thank you so much for organizing this very important event. I'd like to um, move on to the statement of our Armenian colleague about uh, the uh, violation of Armenian sovereign territories. I have a question. What is the proof of these so-called sovereign Armenian territories? As we all know, in the course of the last 30 years, Armenian troops, the armed forces of Armenia, um, plundered the property and these territories. Uh, they destroyed historical and religious uh, monuments of our country in our historical lands. At the same time, I would like to raise another issue that Thomas Deval mentioned, that is the flexibility and non-flexibility of warring parties. The flexibility when a there is a violation of territorial integrity does not exist. It's one of the main um, principles of the international law is respect of 
territorial integrity. All international organizations supported Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. That is supported by different documents and four resolutions of the UN Security Council that for 30 years have not been implemented. This is exactly what happened. The territorial integrity is now reinstated. And today, we have more challenges. We have to work on a long-lasting peace, but take into consideration the statement made by our Armenian colleagues. They still do not share our view. It was mentioned the Armenian phobia in Azerbaijan. 30,000 Armenians live in Azerbaijan. How many Azeris live in Armenia? Can anyone tell me? Zero. This is where the phobia is. And um, Thomas Deval, another question to you. You mentioned OC and its role. What role do you see uh, for the OC in the post-war period? And can the mandate be used and make an input for a long-lasting peace in the region? Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for all the questions and the interventions that we've had so far. Uh, we are way beyond the time frame that we had set, but I mean, some uh, important questions were raised both uh, during now the question and answer phase and uh, um, during uh, uh, the interventions of our speakers. And so the way how I would proceed, I would leave the floor to our four speakers, leaving uh, two minutes each. And uh, I mean, uh, Thomas, I think, is the only one who's received explicit questions. Um, but the others uh, can feel free to comment on any suggestion uh, or thought-provoking uh, idea that has uh, been uh, formulated uh, by other panelists or um, by uh, guests uh, um, during uh, this uh, last phase. Um, so if you agree, I would then uh, uh, leave it uh, to Thomas, and then uh, two minutes to Thomas, two minutes uh, to Tengiz, uh, two minutes uh, uh, to Tallinn, and two minutes to Kabul. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosaria. Um, certainly, it would take me a lot more than two minutes to to answer, but I'll do my best. Um, I would just. Uh, remind everyone that uh, 1921, um, three autonomy solutions were uh, crafted, uh, and, and we're celebrating the centenary, or not celebrating, really marking the centenary of all of them, the um, Northern Ireland staying, um, the rest of Ireland seceding from the United Kingdom, but six counties staying in the United Kingdom, a partition of Ireland, um, that's centenary, the um, all in islands, um, remaining part of Finland, but with subs enormous um, uh, autonomy. And also, um, next week, we're marking the decision, um, July the 5th, it was 1921, that the Bolsheviks um, made the decision um, to um, give, to create the autonomous region of Nagorno Karabakh, which was basically an Armenian autonomous region within Azerbaijan. Um, I think of those three examples, only the Orland Islands is, is a happy one, um, and we have to give credit to the Swedes and Finns um, that they helped, um, they worked hard to make that one work. Northern Ireland, we saw many, many years of violence, um, and it's still not completely resolved, and of course, um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, one century on, we're still seeing the bitterness of the dispute, and you can judge for yourself how heartfelt, how bitter are the exchanges between Armenians and, and Azerbaijanis. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, this conflict is not over. Whether we get, it's, it will continue in some form or another, whether it be through large-scale violence or violence, certainly it will continue at a political level, unfortunately, for, for, for many years to come. I, I think key here is, is the fact that um, there's currently no offer of territorial autonomy from Azerbaijan to the uh, Armenians of Karabakh. This was offered in the past by Mr. Aliyev, President Aliyev. He talked about giving the Karabakh Armenians the highest autonomy in the world. 
um, but that he withdrew that offer and, and now says that uh, that, there, that offer is now no longer on the table. And I, I think until there is some such offer on the table from Azerbaijan, I think it will be very difficult to have any negotiations. And, and that really answers the question about the OSC Minsk Group. That's its job. Um, but it doesn't have anything uh, to work with. Um, so I'm less optimistic. And I would also remind everyone that um, in 2025, the Russian peacekeeping mission um, expires formally, it can be renewed, and that will um, almost certainly be, I think, a focus for renewed tension in the region. My time is already up. Um, uh, George Kalashvili, it's good to see you, George, asked a very relevant question about Russia. I really didn't have time to get to that issue. All I would say is Russia is, I think, both threatening and transactional. I think it can be both at the same or th- both at the same time. I think we see a different Russia in Karabakh to in Georgia. I think we see also see a different situation in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The South Ossetia is very closed, very difficult situation on the border there. Abkhazia, there is now cross-border cooperation, many difficulties there in Abkhazia. So I think um, it's very, very difficult to deal with Russia, but also uh, necessary. Um, and maybe, maybe um, we'll learn a little from the new Russia in Karabakh about how it's possible to do business with Russia. Or maybe we won't. Maybe we'll find it's, it's very difficult still to do business with Russia. My time is up. Um, thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed um, the opportunity and, and the discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. Um, Tengis, please. Is Tengis still there? Yes, thank you, please. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, oh, when it comes to Georgia's NATO membership, Georgia is non-swinging, committed, reliable, and border-sharing partner. And Georgia is the only country in the region which aspires towards uh, full-fledged membership of both EU and NATO. So Georgia is the stronghold of NATO's interest in the region, and its membership will bring only solution and stability to the region. As I already mentioned, uh, NATO communique of 2016 indicates that Georgia has all practical tools to prepare for membership. So what we need, we need political decision. And political decision should be elaborated through such discussions like we had right now. Because uh, this is about our common future. Georgia needs NATO membership, but this is also beneficial to NATO member states. We can't speak about Black Sea security, cooperation in the Black Sea region, East-West cooperation, without Georgia's stability, Georgia's security. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. You were extremely fast. Um, uh, Tallinn, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. So, um, on the two principles, yes, territorial integrity, and the second principle is not the right to secession, it's the right to self-determination. And that right has no predetermined outcome. It has no predetermined outcome. Uh, so we're going back to what Thomas said. We need to uh, be more creative as to the future of that region, or we run the risk of endlessly um, banging our heads on the same walls time and again. Uh, Armenians of Artsakh and uh, Azerbaijanis so far are not speaking to each other directly. Uh, everything goes through uh, the Russian inter- interposition uh, forces in Artsakh. So there might be in time a need for a, a backdoor channel uh, of discussions between these people. And um, naturally, as I said, the same goes for Armenia uh, and uh, Azerbaijan. We can hear through um, the the comments and the reactions on this floor the immense level of suffering, the emotions. Yes, it has been a tragic war. All those grievances must be dealt with, uh, but um, not uh, in the the present platform, uh, obviously. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Kamuz, please. Um, let me re remind us of, of a few things, particularly let me respond to the accusations of the Member of Parliament of Armenia. Um, now, uh, Armenia occupied, the Armenian Republic occupied seven regions outside Nagorno-Karabakh. It committed Khojala massacre and it said we did it very well because it was revenge for the 1915 events. Your President Sarkisyan, he stated very clearly that it was our generation who freed Nagorno-Karabakh. It will be the younger generation who will free other territories of Armenia, including Baku. Now, uh, during the recent war, there was a statement by Deputy uh, Defense Minister of Armenia saying that Ganja will soon become an archaeological site where no humans will be living. We lost 140 residents, during civilians during the war. How many did, did Armenia lose? Very few. Yes, because, because there were a lot of phosphor, phosphorus bombs. I visited all that. But who was occupying whom? Who was, who was sending messages that we have occupied it and you have to accept it? Now, if you don't accept it, we're going to occupy further. Tonayam doctrine. I, I, and, and, of course, on the heritage issue, um, let, me, let me remind my colleague from Armenia that the Armenian church that was destroyed in Kalbajar, that had been built in 2017. Geneva doesn't allow. Do you know why, why it had been built in 2017? Because Armenia had no intention of withdrawing from the occupied regions outside Nagorno Karabakh, except for Ardam. And that is why Ardam was completely destroyed. I went to Kalbajar and I went to Gubadla. I saw Armenian settlements, lots of settlements. You had no, there was no intention, no firm intention of, of moving from those territories. And now you're talking about destroyal of, of heritage. Um, I'm completely surprised at, the, at this ethics. Now, on prisoners of war, no, everybody, you go and read any textbook. I hope there will be a time when, um, you know, we can, have, uh, we can have the opportunity for colleagues from Armenia to attend classes in Azerbaijan, but also in other countries perhaps. A prisoner of war is not entitled. I mean, those people who entered the territory of Azerbaijan, that was after the 10th of November. Yes, uh, and, and that is they're not entitled to prisoner of war status. They come to Azerbaijan to lay landmines, and of course, Azerbaijan needs to embrace them and then send them back and say thank you for killing those two journalists. Those landmines, let me re remind you, were laid in Kalbajar during the time when Armenia requested for extra time to move from those territories. And this is so. Now, my speech was very positive because uh, I have tried to contribute to peace all my time, all, the, all my life um, uh, as an academic. But of course, I cannot, I, cannot, uh, I cannot withstand injustice, particularly when it's so unfair. With Thomas Duval, I completely disagree. Uh, I think the OSC Minsk Group can contribute to the peace process properly. Uh, ter now, President Aliyev is not offering territorial autonomy, autonomy, and I understand him perfectly. Who would offer territorial autonomy after this stage, when so many people have died in the war? Now, put yourself into his shoes, yes? But there can be different forms of it. There, there are many models. You mentioned Northern Ireland, you mentioned other things. There are, there are many other models that we can offer. That's all I wanted to say. I'm still positive, despite these uh, comments from, from Armenian society. Of course, there are always comments, but, but don't let me remind my colleague from Armenia that the cause of those deaths in Armenia, of those wonderful boys who died from both sides in this war, is, was exactly the, the, the hyper-nationalism that you, 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 you're entertaining now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavus. I think that uh, um, this uh, conclusion is... Uh, a very clear um, confirmation of the fact that uh, we need more of these discussions. Uh, there are still so many points um, that uh, need uh, to be uh, agreed and uh, uh, many more conversations would help this uh, difficult process. Thank you very much for the need to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly.
for hosting us, and let me give the floor to uh, Ruxandra Popa, who's uh, the Secretary General uh, of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you, Ruxandra. Uh, thank you very much to you, Rosaria, for uh, moderating uh, this this very interesting, uh, yeah, at times difficult conversation. Uh, but this is because, uh, indeed, these these are complex issues, uh, and it is indeed in the spirit of, of the Rose Roth series uh, to try to discuss uh, these issues and and these developments uh, and draw from from the expertise uh, both from within the region and from outside the region uh, to help um, members of the NATO parliamentary assembly um, better understands uh, the complexities of the region together with their counterparts from the region. So I want to start by thanking uh, all participants who have stayed on uh, despite uh, us going way past the time allocated for this discussion. Uh, very big thank you uh, to our Swiss uh, sponsors uh, for, for this uh, Rose Roth program, the Swiss uh, government uh, for their support uh, for, for this uh, Rose Roth program. A warm thank you uh, to our speakers for sharing their expertise uh, with us uh, on, on these complex issues. Uh, as I said, thank you to all our participants uh, for staying uh, so long. Thank you, Rosaria and the NATO Liaison Office uh, in, in Tbilisi uh, for the assistance they provide to the Assembly um, in, in these programs, but also the many programs that we do jointly. Uh, big thank you to our interpreters for the hard work that they had uh, they had today and, and they always do. And last but certainly not least, a uh, big thank you to Roberta and Andrius on my staff uh, for putting uh, this excellent uh, program together uh, and, and really running the show. So thank you again to all of you. Uh, that's the end of this program now. Um, and uh, yeah, well, as Rosaria says, uh, we will continue to discuss these issues. Uh, no doubt uh, in the future. So thanks, thanks very much to everybody for their participation.